self-improvement is a big value in Unitarian Universalism, not unlike most other faith paths. We try to be the best people we can be, and yet, what do you do when, after your best efforts, you've still um, made terrible mistakes or hurt people, caused destruction? The music this morning was kol nidre, which means all vows. It's a beautiful prayer, um, almost in language that sounds legal to say, if I have made a vow that I cannot keep, I ask to be released from this vow. This is a tradition uh, among some Jewish folks at Yom Kippur. There are many hedges built around this forgiveness of vows. Um, it can't be like money you owe the bank, for example. I know. Mostly, these are vows that you have made to yourself, like... I'm not gonna gamble anymore, or I'm not gonna bite my fingernails, or I'm not gonna bite my spouse's head off, or I'm not going to um, be mean to my sister anymore. And that you, these are the kinds of vows that we try to keep. And yet with all our trying, sometimes we are able, and sometimes we are not. And as they say, it is good to have a plan whether or not you keep to it. So we strive to be good people, smart people, healthy people, nearly perfect people, and yet we fall short, we fall down. Some of us have even sat at uh, healthy relations workshops and been tempted to bite the head off of somebody who's talking too much. <laughs> the All Vows prayer says that we are people and we will fall down, and when we fall down, we get up knowing that we will fall again. I was amazed when I first heard about this tradition. I was raised in the Presbyterian Church, which did not have this tradition. Um, we were forgiven, you know, because we knew we were going to fall because we were wretches, you know, miserable wretches, sinners. And, um, and we were just doing well if we didn't knock over the local 7-Eleven when we needed grocery money and... Um, <laughs> So I was grateful to a people who had a different understanding of God than the one I had been raised to. And the God of my childhood would not have been surprised that you broke your promise. He knew you couldn't have kept your promise in the first place um, because of your weakness. Um, but release you from your vows? No. You're weak. You made vows. Too bad. You made your bed. Lie in it. Keep your vows wrapped like barbed wire around your heart. Just carry it around and it'll remind you what a wretch you are. <laughs> and by the way, you're a sheep too. A dumb sheep and a wretch. <laughs> and to include a prayer in which you were released for your, uh, the, uh, that you could be released, either you talk to three lay people and if they agree that you should be released, then you can be, or one ordained person, um, and, and if they say, yes, okay, this is a vow you could be released from then. That felt like mercy to me like mercy. And it was very unusual um, in my experience of growing up to be encouraged to be merciful with yourself. Even if you're sick, it meant you'd done something wrong. There was very little mercy. One of the traditional stories of the High Holy Days is about the half-brothers Isaac and Ishmael. And those of you who grew up in church or synagogue know the story. Um, Abraham was married to Sarah. They were visited by the angels who said they would have many, many children. Um, that did not come true uh, by the time they were very, very old. And um, Sarah thought she would fix it. 
She talked to her husband about it. He said, just, you know best, you know, like husbands do. And um, the ones that are married for a long time. And um, so she decided that she would give her handmaiden, Hagar, to Abraham and that Abraham would have a child by her because at that time they felt that the whole everything that was going to be the child was inside the dad and just grew in the mom like a terrarium and so um, <laughs> didn't really matter which terrarium you used um, as long as it was the dad's child um, I'm, this is nowhere in the Bible <laughs> just, just to be clear um, so she gave him Hagar, her handmaiden, and, and Hagar, sure enough, uh, had a son named Ishmael. Well, then Sarah got pregnant and had a son named Isaac. And Sarah, as soon as she had her own baby, was wicked jealous of Ishmael and his mom. And so she fretted and fretted and fretted about it. Went to her husband again. He said, you do what you need to do. And so she threw Hagar and Ishmael out into the desert, out where you die in the desert. And the story is that um, Hagar was desperate and um, ran back and forth and back and forth in the desert until finally she came to a well. And the well saved their lives. And at the well she prayed and God said, go back and live with Sarah and Abram and you, your son and her son will be the father of great nations. And she named that well, the well of the living one who sees me, who sees me. Because she had felt so invisible you know how you do when you're in a powerless position and someone is always lording over you. She was happy to be seen and happy to be alive. And that was what she named the well. And our tradition says um, that Ishmael was the father of the Arab nations. Isaac was the father of the Jewish nations. Uh, they never got along, never have, never will. But uh, the never will part is mitigated again by tradition, which says that when Abraham died, Isaac and Ishmael buried him together in the place with the well. And that the tradition says that there was a reconciliation. And that gives a person hope. So it is a theme of repentance, forgiveness, reconciliation that runs through these holy days here at the time of the fall of the gathering darkness in the northern hemisphere. Yom Kippur is translated day of judgment and it is fitting that it should be celebrated here in the darkening time of the year. Mystics all over the northern hemisphere talk about the growing darkness as a time of meditation, a time of looking within, a time of reflection, a time of growing your roots. Plants grow their roots in the fall. That's why you should plant in the fall because then the root systems have a good long time to grab hold. The root systems need quiet and they need dark in order to grow and so they can nourish the plant when the showy part comes in the spring. But the unshowy part under the ground is just as important and the same thing with human beings. You know, we have to become sturdy and we have to become stable and we have to sink our roots down in the ground so that when we can um, when we come to the blossoming productive time we can we can do that so reflection for us at this time of year means looking at our I want to say our good deeds and our destructive ones because that's what preachers always say but when you really are um, honest with yourself when you're sitting by yourself writing a sermon and um, staring at the wall and thinking good deeds and bad deeds really do I feel like because sometimes you just have deeds and sometimes you know whether they're creative or destructive but sometimes you don't know you just do things and different stuff happens um, the uh, the 12-step language 
for what happens during this time of reflection and repentance is taking a searching and fearless moral inventory. So you look at yourself. You look at yourself. And you see what qualities do you have. And you don't think good qualities, bad qualities, because people have qualities and they all have two sides. You know what I mean? You can be a really nice person, and sometimes nice is great, but sometimes nice is not so good because you let people get away with too much. And you can be a really um, direct, plain spoken person, and sometimes that's really called for and very necessary, but other times it's just meanness. You can be a very diplomatic person, and that is called for sometimes. Or you can be a kind of a warrior, and that is called for sometimes. So every quality has its um, possibilities. See, I can't even figure out a way to talk about it. It's possibilities for creativity, and it's po possibilities for destruction. But then I also think, as I'm sitting on my couch writing my sermon, staring at the wall, because this is what writing looks like. <laughs> Broken up by periods of procrastination. So you think, okay, I, I, I want to see myself clearly, and I want to I um, see the things I've done, and I want to understand what is creative and what is destructive, but I also think sometimes destructive is good. I'm a gardener. You know, I've been a gardener for years and years and years, and if you're a gardener, you have to destroy things in order to plant new things. You get to pull up the leggy stuff and put in the other stuff. If you're talking about annuals, you get to destroy what we've arbitrarily said are weeds in order to let what we've arbitrarily said are valuable plants to grow. Weeds have nothing that they're doing wrong. They just do it better and more efficiently than the stuff that <laughs> we want. So we value those things more. So taking a searching and fearless moral inventory is way more complicated than it sounds like. Because you have to look at the kind of person you are. Now, in order to look at the kind of person you are, do you do that by yourself? Well, you can start by yourself, but being in a community is also good. Being partnered with someone you trust is also good. Um, looking to your ex to tell you what kind of a person you are, not a good idea. <laughs> you want someone kind of neutral or someone who loves you. And you want to be sturdy, and you want to have deep roots, and you want to be able to stand there and not make excuses and skate over the surface of your life saying, oh, yeah, but, but the reason I did that was, oh, yeah, but excuse, excuse, reason, reason, reason. You want to be able to stand there and say, yes, I did that. Yes, I did that. That is the beginning of health and wisdom and good character. So we enter into the time of darkness and we remind ourselves that in the Jewish scriptures in the book of uh, Genesis, we call it Genesis, uh, God created the dark and the light and called them both good. And so our whole culture's obsession with using uh, darkness as a way of talking about uh, ignorance or evil is just um, kind of arbitrary and weird in that all darkness is is a place where you just can't see as far as you can see when it's light, and so it can be a metaphor for a time of not being able to see where you're going, but it's not a metaphor, a good metaphor for, for evil or ignorance, because darkness is good, and darkness is sacred, and darkness is what our roots need in order to sink down and make us sturdy. And most religions have a description of the sacred dark, we just don't have time for her. But um, <laughs> the days of awe are times for us to reflect and times for us to look at ourselves and times for us to go to the well with the mystery who sees us as we are. Now, the thing about the mystery that we believe or that I believe and it has no bearing on what you have to believe the thing about the mystery is that the mystery sees you with the eyes of love. The mystery says, you will fall, you will get up. I see who you are. 
I want you to see who you are. And I want you to see who you are with the eyes of love, like I see who you are. So I'm going to end by reading this wonderful poem by Nancy Schaefer. Because we spill not only milk, knocking it over with an elbow when we reach out to wipe a small face, but also spill seed on soil we thought was fertile but isn't, and also spill whole lives, and only later see in fading light how much is gone. And we hadn't intended it. Because we tear not only cloth, thinking to find a true edge, and instead making only a hole, but also tear friendships when we grow and whole mountainsides because we are so many and we want to live right where the black oaks lived once very quietly and still because we forget not only what we're doing in the kitchen and have to go back to the room we were in before to remember why it was we left, but also forget entire lexicons of joy and how we lost ourselves for hours, yet all that time were clearly found and held and also forget the hungry not at our table because we weep not only at jade plants caught in a freeze and precious papers left in the rain, but also at legs that no longer walk or never did, although from the outside they look like most others, and also weep at words said once as though they might be rearranged, but which, once loose, refused to return, and were helpless because we are imperfect and love so deeply. We will never have enough days. We need the gift of starting over, beginning again, just this constant good, this saving hope.